Hello and welcome to this edition of Book Splash on Splash FM 105.5 Ibado. It's always a great moment to discuss books and chat with writers. So that time is here again. I am Michael or Latum Bosun. The book on the table today is titled Reflections, a collection of short essays written by Wale or Laito and published in 2019 by Wine Press Publishing Ibadan. The author Wale or Laito holds a master's in criminology and criminal justice from Griffith University, Australia. Mr. Lighton writes passionately about politics, especially about the need to improve the people's living standards in Nigeria. His passion also stems from his experience growing up under the military junta's during his undergraduate days. Mr. Wale Olayton's other book, Ideas for Social Political Change, a collection of my social media commentaries, was published in 2015 in Australia, where he lives. Reflections is his second published work, and it's a collection of essays written between July 2015 and June 2019, and grouped into 13 chapters. In the author's introduction, we read that this collection of essays offers the author's broader insight about the political situations in Nigeria and that it is a collection of the author's highly personal thoughts on political issues in Nigeria with mirror references to a few global news headlines. Still in the introductory page of the work, the author wonders aloud about the nagging perpetual subjectivity of truth in today's political discourse and the fact that it is especially aided by the preponderance of fake news. It's somewhat disturbing that today, alternative truth reigns in political discourses, despite there being no substitute for truth. Thus, what you have now is the tendency for people to interpret what is the truth based on the political party whose card they carry. The author begins on a hopeful note by stating that although creating a new Nigeria is possible, but that it requires urgency and it's a task for all Nigerians, those at home and are millions in the diaspora. But the author proceeds to lament the various evils that dog the nation, including the unpardonable socio-economic indices, the unbridled population and gross mismanagement, which are direct functions of misgovernance and alarming lutocracy. The author wonders aloud why or how it is possible for people who were stupendously rich before they served in government would continue to accumulate wealth illegally at the expense of extremely poor Nigerians. He avers here that there must be something fundamentally wrong with many politicians in our part of the world which requires proper diagnosis. And he asks the question, why do wealthy politicians steal from their poor constituents? Still preoccupied with the poor governance that holds sway in this part of the world, Wale Olaito embarks on a hysteric listing of the consequences of poor leadership in Nigeria and Africa. The scores of Africans that embark on perilous journeys across the Sahara Desert and the attendant deaths of many in rickety boats, all in a bid to escape from their fatherland and get to Europe in search for better life. The thousands trapped in prostitution rings in Europe, the thousands trapped in modern-day slavery in the Middle East, and the many on death row for drug trafficking in Asia and thousands in different prisons across the world. Of course, it's not all doom and gloom. The author claims that the journey to a new Nigeria has started. He mentioned the election that brought President Muhammadu Buhari to power as the beginning of the change. He also states that to make that Nigeria possible, we must look beyond the APC-PDP dichotomy when we discuss issues of national significance. We must shift our allegiance from parties to Nigeria and look beyond ethnic and religious affiliations and combine energies in creating a new Nigeria with limitless opportunities. In the section tagged Early Warning Signs, the author contends that change has been hijacked. The author perpetually harps on the fact that the people must decide whether to remain vigilant and guard their votes jealously or allow these political circles to continue. The political circles here refers to the June 2015 hijack of the leadership of the National Assembly. You're still listening to Book Splash on Splash FM 105.5 Ibado, and I'm discussing the book Reflections, a collection of short essays written by Wale or Lighton, 
In this book, the author believes that the business of governance requires bringing together the best brains a nation can assemble and that the country has millions of competent people to choose from. The author criticizes the deployment of billions to purchase cars for past leaders while millions wallow in poverty. In this book, the author agrees with the verdict that many African leaders are corrupt. In fact, he thinks that it is criminal for them to loot the resources of their countries for onward stashing in foreign accounts under bogus names, especially in Swiss banks. But he also castigates the West in this pillaging of Africa. He believes that it is wrong for Western accomplices to initially ignore the obvious irregular circumstances of these transactions until the demise of the ignorant dictator and then move swiftly to freeze the accounts and other assets. For the author, this is a moral issue to which the West is blind or pretends not to see it. In a similar vein, he castigates the United States of America for a 2015 refusal to assist the Nigerian government to defeat the dangerous Boko Haram group based on allegations of human rights violation, but will support Israel's occupation of Gaza or the war atrocities in Iraq, Afghanistan and the rest. For the author, this is tantamount to allowing Boko Haram to continue with his reign of impunity. In fact, it reeks of hypocrisy. In the book, Reflections, a collection of short essays, Wally Light also discusses the key issues at stake for the nation during the days of President Buhari's health uncertainties. The author, writing in a piece in 2017, challenged the nation's double standards, especially regarding how people in the ruling party and those in government handle the health of the president. He thought that since the president's health issues then had somewhat affected governance, the president should have just resigned. He castigated the northern power brokers of selfishly and deliberately wanting the president to complete his eight-year tenure at the expense of his health and that of the nation. Even as a die-hard supporter of President Buhari, the author is visibly angry with the president for his 2018 labeling of Nigerian youths as lazy. At a point in this book, the author resigns to fate by musing, regrettably, that the 2019 election was once again a two-horse race. According to him, from all indications, it appears the transformational messages of young presidential aspirants have not resonated with most Nigerians. And sadly, the hype that heralded the emergence of a new generation of politicians is gradually fading away as the politicking deepens among the key players. They say people deserve its leaders. Nigerians know what to do when they are ready to elect visionary and energetic leaders. End of quote. And talking about jumping ship, the author suddenly moves from being a staunch supporter of President Buhari and his All Progressives Congress to being an ardent critic, to becoming a proponent of alternative candidates, especially outside the traditional APC-PDP trappings. In this book, the author appears to have been won over by Omoyele Shoure, for the author writes of Shoure's consistency, determination, tenacity, and uncommon courage in the face of opposition from older generations, younger generations, and even his own generation. But on another level, he writes that Shoure needs mature and intellectually sound people around him for general guidance and the formulation of sound socio-economic policies. He cannot continue to make policy statements without being able to substantiate his pronouncements. In this book, the author has a broad collection of essays about politics in Ogun State, about June 12, and the socio-economic elements of electioneering campaigns in Nigeria, among others. In the closing section of the book, Mr. Wally Olighton has a collection of tributes for some departed persons, including Stephen Keshi and Pius Adesomi. You are listening to Book Splash on Splash FM 105.5 and it's time to meet my guest, the author of the book, Reflections, a collection of short essays, Wale Olaito. In this interview, Mr. Wale Olaito discusses why he wrote the book, his perception of President Buhari's government, among other things. Mr. Wale Olaito, welcome to Book Splash, sir. Thanks for having me on the program. What occasioned the putting together of the book, Reflections? In 2015, I published my first book, which is tied to the um, ideas for social political change, a collection of my social media commentaries. So I went through a pre- period of trying to see what am I going to do next, you know, as a first time, you know, published author. 
I enjoy the euphoria and, mm. you know, the name recognition. Of course. You know, media recognition. And then, you know, in that process, I thought, okay, so what has changed since 2015? Let me see how far my opinions or uh, ideas have changed in that period. And then again, I started collecting my short essays uh, just from social media, mostly on Facebook. Most importantly to say, dedicating a chapter in my first book, Mm. Uh, to President Muhammad Buhari, uh, mm. which I call uh, the People's General. All that euphoria that went into the 2015 election uh, to my obviously uh, change of views uh, around the president and some of his policies and how decisive he has become. So I wanted to see what I've written and I wanted to see, you know, in a lot of changes in the trend okay so that really motivated me to go mm. back to you know collect my you know um, my short essays uh, and yeah and that led to the publication of reflections um mm. you know a collection of short essays in the introduction to this book you wondered aloud about the subjectivity of truth in today's political discourse and the preponderance of alternative truth fake news etc in the political space these elements have taken over or seem to have taken over the political space of today even across the world not just about nigeria and then you believe that this is not really good for development uh, you wrote here in this era of fake news the truth has become even more subjective in political discourse so people's interpretation of truth is more dependent on the political party they belong or the political ideologies that they share. So today, we don't have truth as it is. We only have truth as defined by the color of your political party or your tribal or ethnic grouping. How did we get to that juncture? Now I'm still trying to really reconcile as a nation how we've been able to travel that path to get to where we are today. Well, just thinking aloud, as you said, in terms of the subjectivity of truth, in terms of um, the level of uh, misinformation, disinformation, and just blatant denial of something that is you know, obvious, mostly um, because of uh, political you know, affiliations and in some cases uh, because of ethnic affiliations that people just uh, create their own truth. In this era of fake news, it becomes so difficult because a writer, a journalist, after research, could promote a particular view in, in the media, but the political party or the, the politician on the receiving end could just easily just turn around and just say it's, it's you know fake news. And majority of the party members or the majority of supporters of that um, politician will not even think about it. They will just take it exactly the well. It's all fake news. Just try mm. to discredit their politician or to discredit their leader. And I can't think of any leader <laughs> in recent memory mm. that has been able to do that more than you know, uh, the, the current president of the United States and his followers. Coming to Nigeria, it, the same pattern is, is really right there in terms of the um, the ailers and, and the whalers. <laughs> that special carnage mm. is either you are supporting the, the current president or you are against uh, the president. Mm. And, and regardless of uh, the opinions you're trying to express, you know, no matter how factual the opinions are, most likely the people on the, on the rece receiving end are highly likely to interpret it as just trying to discredit uh, the president. And, but fundamentally, the impact of truth in democracy is that it promotes accountability. It promotes um, probity. So mm. it is good for the citizens to know the truth because it's an enabler of trying to promote that accountability and so from time to time to ask you know relevant questions around governance that accountability which is an in integral part of our democracy one of those things that struck me in your book is you wrote that uh, a new nigeria is possible maybe it's because you are in the diaspora a lot of people in nigeria here don't believe that i can understand how people feel that way i can understand people's reality that reality of going on without electricity uh, they live in that reality of getting stuck in, in traffic for yeah. hours to get back home they live in that reality of finishing university 
with masters or PhD degrees without getting a job. So I can relate to how people feel that, you know, there's nothing for this country. But as the Nigerian diaspora, the whole idea is that sometimes we get easily uh, labeled as, you know, a social media activist that um, we kind of take comfort in disparaging our homeland. As far as I'm concerned, the major reason I do what I do and promote, you know, good governance is that I, I believe that as a nation, we, we can really get it right. You believe that we can get it right. But at the same time, there's a fundamental question that you raised in the book. The fact that many politicians, even though they were very rich before getting into office, that they still steal from their people. When you have a preponderance or you have, you know, a lot of politicians in government who are stealing from their people, how do you get a better developed nation? But at the, at the end of the day, I think that on both sides, the politicians and the citizens, there must be accountability on both sides. There's a valid argument around how valid are uh, the elections in Nigeria and how valid is the process of getting them elected. But I also believe that at this stage in the history of any nation, people have to decide and ask themselves that this cannot continue and that they need to organize to be able to send a message to their system. I know the importance of money politics, I know the influence of poverty, and now the political class over the years have used that against people. I get all that, but I also be, I don't want to believe that that melancholic situation we continue forever. I would think that people at this stage, they have to come to that realization as well that something has to give way. You were campaigning very vigorously for Buhari to be president in 2015. That's correct, because at this stage, I believe that the level of decay in the polity in Nigeria at the time, the, le the level of uh, insecurity in Nigeria, uh, the level of corruption among ministers, it was... Uh, at a very alarming rate, probably unprecedented in the industry of the nation. So yeah. I feel that we needed a change from uh, the PDP after 16 years in power. Even though Buhari passed military, military head of state, he had his own area of strength and he had his uh, weaknesses. I felt that we, we needed that kind of uh, someone that could come in at, at that time as the father of the nation and with that perception of him being against corruption, I'll be able to use that to, to leverage on that and bring the people together and be able to provide that leadership. So I, I did that for him based on the fact that I believe that we've witnessed the worst we, you know, under hmm. Jonathan. I'm still discussing the book Reflections, a collection of short essays, and Mr. Wally Olighton is still with me. There's this part of your book that interested me a lot. After expressing your disappointment with the Buhari government and the APC at some point, you started pushing for the alternative parties. So you wanted a deviation from the APC PDP philosophy. I was really surprised at your choice of Omoyele Shoure. What is the attraction? You have asked me that many times. Um, looking back now, Omoyele Shoure and I were of the same generation. During the uh, June 12 struggle and the role that you know many university students played at the time. He was very active in that process. I followed some of the other younger candidates, Feladro Toye, Kinsley Mogalu, mm -hmm. and I followed Omoyo Lishore very well. But as you asked, I felt that I, I was more connected to uh, Omoyo because of what we've had in terms of that student unionism background, mm. that uh, political consciousness. I felt that we needed something more than just a politician at the time. I felt more comfortable with Shore in that sense, in terms of he's able to articulate his ideas mm. in a certain way that I felt that someone that if really want to change Nigeria, we have to detach from the establishment and do something differently. But if you observe very well, it has become increasingly difficult for the other so-called alternative parties to really have a have their mouth in the pie of electioneering. In the in 2019 election, 
all the other candidates combined did not score up to 2% of the votes. Even the invalid votes uh, were more than those scored by all the other candidates you know, combined, except for Buhari and Atiku, who had about 97% of the votes. Don't you think that we are just living in illusion, thinking that the other parties will spring a surprise and produce a president in the nearest future in this country. Yeah, look, I think the Nigerian people also will have to decide exactly what we want. And I asked that question in a part of the book. I was talking directly to the Nigerian youth that they are at that, at that last election to choose. Previously, people have complained of, you know, a lack of alternative um, candidates as a reason why they had no choice than to pick from either the same people, you know, APC or PDP. But in, in, in last election, they had a choice of uh, a Kingston Mogalu. Mm-hmm. The Kiss Mugalu that is very articulate and also in terms of his policy ideas. So between them, they, they receive a total vote of uh, 72,618. So my question was this at the time. If for years you complain of not having alternative parties or not have young people, and then you had three vibrant young people, they have their own uh, strengths, they have their weaknesses like every other person. But despite all the uh, social media rust matters, at the end of the day, they were able to get just over 72,000 votes. So to me, that was concerning. Mm. It was concerning, and I was really asking that, what do you really want? Mm. What, what kind of Nigeria do you really want? <laughs> if you have to choose between the same people, I felt that it was a no-brainer. To me, I think we also need to take a good look at ourselves. I know mm. that we, the electorate, we come up with this kind of sense of hopelessness. Mm. As mm. if we don't even have a say. As if we just, wow, well, what can we really do? Is these politicians that are using money or talks and, and what of you? In your book, you also complained about the absence of a national value. What do you think the problems are? Or how can we craft a national philosophy? We don't seem to have any. We have, you know, splatterings of groups who are, that are agitating. We seem not to be one nation. What exactly are the issues that you think we need to look at? In Australia, there is something we call mateship. Uh, the concept of mateship is that uh, whoever is next to you is your mate. Your mm. neighbor, you know, across the road or next door is, is your mate. And your concept is that you do good to, you know, to someone. It's just very simple. You try and help when you can. You assist in whatever form and also that transfers to you know workplace in trying to be a good person basic things like you know in yoruba we have the concept of amoluabi okay um which is like you know a capacity you know a, a, a lot of things to you know values uh, they are not alien to to a country and i'm sure you can look back and see uh, among our fathers the way they live their lives for me i think that what is obtainable for example in yoruba land um, is different to what you see when you go up north in terms of what we consider as values or things that we believe are very important mm. When you go, you know, across to the maybe the southeastern part of the country, you you see a different set of values, and I think because of that lack of political leadership, pretty much everyone for himself, people are just trying to survive and do whatever they need to do. If you listen to narratives of politicians, I don't think we have a sense of what really connects us together, other than some superficial kind of identity. So I think we need to define that of, okay, if I'm a Nigerian, what is it all about? And we really speak with one voice. Okay. And to me, that explains that we don't really have much in common. So if we don't have much in common, why has it been very difficult for us to sit down and agree on what exactly we want to do with our nation or about our nation? That's what I ask myself. uh, Why are we the way we are, you know, as a people? But the attraction to political offices, unfortunately, is more around what people really want to gain financially the way it is, the, the, the current structure that we have we have on the ground. Mm. If that remains the main attraction, that people are going there not being futuristic and trying to come up with policies of how do we improve? How do we really get here? It's strongly linked, in my, in my opinion, 
to people really uh, going to political offices without any sense of, of service mm. to the community, without any, any sense of building their own legacies about what do they want to be remembered for. Now, I'd like to close on a lighter note. You seem to have, in fact, you wrote in the book that you have now joined the group of people referred to as whalers. Are you happy carrying that label? You got to have a sense of humor, you know, and I think that we need that. When we look around and everything is becoming insane, the subjectivity of truth and how people really argue over things and, you know, no matter what I write or uh, I try to be as objective as possible, um, there are people out there that they see it as just... Uh, just criticizing the president for the sake of just criticizing the president that they don't see it as anything constructive mm. you know, they see people with uh, different opinions used as you know people that are out there to get the president so i just felt that i saw the funny side of it and i said well um people see me as uh, one of people in that uh, category of whalers and I'm just happy to, you know, to be called a whaler, you know. Mr. Wally Olaiton is the author of the collection of essays, Reflections. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you very much. I hope you liked that conversation with Mr. Wally Olaiton, author of the book, Reflections, a collection of short essays. If you did, please join me for another time on Book Splash on Splash FM 105.5 Ibadan. Same time next Saturday. On behalf of my sound manager, Victor Daudu, I thank you for listening. I have 10 books to give out again this week. To win a book today, just text your full name and location to 0805 699 Please note that only the first 10 text messages that I receive will get a book each. In case you have a question or query, please send me a text message on 0805-699-8676 or email molatumbosun at splashfm1055.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Mike Tumbosun. My name is Michael Olatumbosun and I urge you to read the book today.